every other year or so, I like to have a program about an architect. It's nice to know who's designed what in town, and we've had such great architects here, uh, past and, and present. And we've had programs on Cerny, uh, Stanley Anderson, we've had Adler programs, we've had Lindbergh programs, and today we give you a Bennett programs. So today we give you Evan Hill Clark, and what a stunning architect he was. Um, Tom, <clears throat> Tom is, has been recognized as a preeminent classical architect and urban designer. Uh, he designed projects for clients in Chicago, here on the North Shore, and as far away as Virginia's horse country. <clears throat> he graduated magna cum laude from the University of Notre Dame, and also had studies, continuous studies, at the American Academy in Rome, Italy. This past year, he was a recipient of two accountants awards from the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art for Excellence in Architecture and Landscape Design. And he's been named one of the top 40 architects of his generation in the U.S. for the prestigious 40 Under 40 listing. In addition to his directing his architectural practice, he's taught undergraduate and graduate design studios um, as a visiting professor at U of I Chicago and the University of Notre Dame in Rome, Italy, and South Bend. He served as guest critic, uh, review critic at Yale University and University of Maryland. His projects have been recognized, that we know, by the Lake Forest Preservation Foundation, and several of his restoration projects have sus subsequently been placed on the National Register of Historic Places. With that, I give you Thomas Norman Riker. Uh, good afternoon. As Jan said, 15 years uh, ago, uh, I stood here talking about an architect uh, that a lot of people didn't know about uh, at the time named Harry Lindeberg, and we were working for the Terlato family restoring Tangley Oaks uh, in, in Lake Bluff, which was a Lindeberg project, and they did a beautiful job with that, the family's great stewards of that house. Uh, I find myself here 15 years later still trying to fill in pieces of information about who the architects were that made the most important buildings that have basically become the setting for all of your everyday lives. Um, I, it reminds me in a way, talking about Clark and the fact that we have a relatively limited amount of time and even less time now, um, it reminds me of the fact that, that, that Georgina Massan once said about the city of Rome, non è basta una vita, meaning a lifetime wouldn't be enough to fully understand Rome. 30 minutes is not enough time to understand Edwin Hill Clark, so I'll do my best to give you a good sense of who he was. Uh, what really remains is for there to be a sort of a book length treatment of him at some point uh, by someone who likes writing books. Um, what I would also say is that I worked also here in town for, uh, for uh, Jim Farrell, who ran a company called Illinois Toolworks, and he gave me this beautiful tour of the headquarters of ITW a number of years ago, and he said, you know, you're probably never more than a few feet away from an Illinois Toolworks product, and that apparently came from uh, the, the comedian and talk show host Steve Allen was enlisted by ITW to do commercials. And, and did that as a way of promoting the fact that ITW has a wide reach. Well, what I would say is that you're probably never more than about a 10-minute car drive away from an Edwin Hill Clark house, which is all the more astonishing. It's something I think we should pay attention to, that somehow this guy's done that much work, and yet so many people are yet unaware of who he is. Uh, next slide. So I think a part of making that make sense for all of us is to first look at who Clark was in the context of his contemporaries. Who was living when Clark was living? Because we tend to forget that stuff. And I'm, a, I'm an architect, I'm not an historian, but these things actually obtain to our understanding of, of what was going on in the world. Now, Frank Lloyd Wright is the oldest of this group of people. I'm showing you Frank Lloyd Wright, Howard Van Doren Shaw, Clark, Adler, and, and Mies van der Rohe. Uh, but only 19 years separates all of them. So in fact, Frank Lloyd Wright's on the ground 11 years before Edwin Hill Clark is born, and he's not even practicing architecture until Edwin Hill Clark's a teenager. <coughs> So what you see is that there are basically, if you will, two schools happening here. There are the modernists represented in two different ways by Wright and Mies, bracketing these three other architects, Howard Van Doren Shaw, Edmund Hill Clark, and David Adler. It was only in 1970 with Richard Pratt's monograph on David Adler that this guy who had done all these really important things started to come back to light. Now more currently, my, my good friend and colleague uh, Stuart Cohen has authored a really an important book on Howard Van Dorn Shaw, soon to be published, it's ready to be published. So what's amazing though is if you want to find books about Frank Lloyd Wright, you can find about 130 books. 
And if you find, want to find books about Mies, you probably find 30 or 40. My point is that maybe the Preservation Foundation ought to retitle themselves the Lake Forest Information Foundation, <laughs> because what it's doing is it's actually helping share what was a kind of an amnesia of history. We, we were some, I would argue, these two folks didn't want us to remember that work, and we'll see a little bit more later, later in the talk what was actually happening behind the scenes. <clears throat> Next slide. So in, in early April of 1878, uh, Edwin Hill Clark was born. He's the fourth child in the family, the third boy in the family, uh, to Allison Clark and Sarah Clark. Um, Edwin's father was a director of the Chicago Board of Trade, uh, a very successful one, and they lived on Calumet Street on, on the near south side of Chicago, about 35th Street, very near where IIT is today. Next. At the age of 53 in 1891, Edwin Hill Clark's dad retires from the Board of Trade and opens up a paint manufacturing business. And this is very important to help understand how Edwin Hill Clark became who he was. Next. Two years after that paint business opened up, the World's Columbian Exposition came to Chicago, built primarily by architects who were, who were based in New York City, but it was based on a classical model. So suddenly what was called the White City gets built on the, on the far south side of Chicago near the current Museum of Science and Industry, which was reconstructed in stone from a version that it was built in plaster for the fair. And when that happens, Edwin Hill Clark's turning 15. So he's getting ready to go off, to, he goes off to boarding school. He's getting ready to go off to boarding school, but in his backyard, he's looking at these buildings, including this masterwork by Richard Morris Hunt, the administration building from the fair. Hunt was the first architect who'd studied at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts in Paris, and he was bringing the influence of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, which is a place where you learned about classicism, bringing that influence to Chicago. The refinement of those buildings had a profound influence on everybody in the city, but it also presumably had a kind of less clear but, but definitive influence on Clark. Next. So a word about the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. When you went to the Ecole, you didn't study how to copy old buildings. The Ecole treated classical architecture the same way that the Renaissance in Italy and France and elsewhere treated classical architecture from antiquity. It looked at classical architecture as a way of figuring out how can new designers use the language of classicism and stand on the shoulders of the people who came before them to make new buildings for new purposes. So just before Clark's dad starts that paint business, there's a New Yorker named William Otis, who's going to become very important in Clark's career, who passes the entrance examination. There aren't a whole lot of Americans who make it into the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. It's French. It's a little bit elitist. But a handful of American artists make it there, Richard Morris Hunt having been the first. And he studies at the Ecole and ends up back in Chicago practicing by the time of the world's Columbian Exposition. Next. In the meantime, Young Edwin Hill Clark works his way to Phillips Andover Academy, but he's seen the fair literally in his backyard. And so between Phillips Andover Academy and then his, then his studies of chemistry at Yale University, uh, from which he graduates in 1901, he experiences something he couldn't have really experienced here in Chicago. In Chicago, the, the, the Great Fire had decimated a pretty big part of the city's history, its historic architectural fabric in, in 1871. And so by the time Clark is, is born, seven years later, the city is still reconstructing, kind of recreating itself. Clark goes and sees the, the history of the campuses at Andover Academy uh, and at Yale and begins to understand that there is a richer, more beautiful way of using architectural language because he lives within that language. Upon completion of his studies at Yale, he comes back and he joins his dad's paint business. Uh, but within a year, and this is with a degree from Yale, so presumably it was a good education, but presumably there was a lot of liberal arts education there as well, so it married the, the academic with the practical. Within a year of coming back at his dad's company from the raw materials, he develops lead poisoning. Uh, one could say glass half empty. But then he, in a period of recuperation beginning in, in 1902, um, a, a, a t for a two-year period, he ends up enrolling in drafting classes at a newly formed school on the south side of Chicago called the Armour Institute. And he discovers that he actually really loves architecture. And maybe that mishap with, with the lead paint in his father's company 
wasn't so bad after all, class half full. <laughs> so the Armour Institute, uh, this is a little sort of history of it before it became IIT. Um, it opens in 1893, so the same year as the fair, Philip Danforth Armour I founds this place uh, for, for a variety of studies, including library science, uh, architecture, engineering, uh, and chemistry. Um, and Philip An Danforth Armour's uh, grandson was the one who actually commissioned Tanglio, so it's interesting to see the way all these things sort of knit their way together. So that curriculum includes the, the disciplines that I described, and the curriculum for the School of Architecture was modeled after the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. American institutions were just beginning to teach architecture. The first curriculum was at MIT, and it was only about 30 years before this. So as architecture began to be taught here, the accepted standard of excellence was what was being taught at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts. So in 1902, with lead poisoning, Edwin Hill Clark take, starts taking drafting classes. And then in 1938, and this is just a way to recognize again the kind of the sweep of things and how things change. In 1938, among others, David Adler actually recommends that the Armour Institute hire a young, relatively young, uh, Mies van der Rohe uh, from Germany to come and rewrite the curriculum on the model of the Bauhaus. Uh, he does that, and in short order, in 1940, the school is renamed the Illinois Institute of Technology, IIT. William Otis, though, the architect that we were talking about a moment ago that had studied at the Ecole in the late 1870s, becomes the mentor to Clark. And his process in Chicago begins by returning from the Ecole and going to work for William LeBaron, William LeBaron Jenny, who was, of course, the father or one of the people that are considered the father, some credited to Sullivan, I credited to Jenny, the father of the modern American skyscraper. He works there after Burnham was there. He works there after Sullivan was there. So he's kind of on the heels of those folks. He rises to partner in 1886, but then he goes off on his own in 1889, so just before the fair begins. He also becomes a lecturer on architecture, and this, I think, is really important. There's often the assumption, and we'll come back to this a little bit later, there's often the assumption that, that the architects that made classical architecture were simply copying old buildings. And the reality of it was that at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, compositional principles were being taught. It wasn't a matter of cloning building parts and making something look good because it was familiar, because it looked old. Rather, there were theories and strategies understood to be behind the work of the greatest masters. Otis begins teaching that stuff at the Art Institute. His design in 1893, so the year of the fair, and as, as Clark is, is off to Phillips Andover Academy, is designed for the Lunt Library in Evanston, which you'll see here, um, establishes his, his bona fides as an exceptional practitioner of classicism. Uh, this building is, is used now as the math department at Northwestern. Um, it's one of many, many, many buildings that, that Otis did in the early years of his practice. By 1908, Edwin Hill Clark, who has only had drafting classes, who he, so he doesn't really understand architecture in a sophisticated way, he knows how to draw. He's basically a, kind of a machine for drawing, if you will, brought into Otis's practice. So he joins it in 1903 after two years uh, at, at the Armour Institute. Five years later, which is pretty quick given the amount of education he had, he's made a partner and the firm's name has changed to Otis and Clark. This is particularly important because one can assume that in those five years, his education was done at the, at the hands of Otis. Now, if we think back to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, the Ecole de Beaux-Arts was an atelier system, meaning that there was a master who basically taught a number of students how to make architecture. It was a kind of an amazingly interactive setting. It was also a very grueling and disciplined setting. Clark would have experienced something that was analogous to that in working in William Otis's office. In 1910, the first of the work that all of you might know about starts to come into play. So it's really in this partnership of Otis and Clark, these early years of, of Clark's architectural life, that we begin to see what he's capable of and see what his formative influences are. So in 1910, uh, James Ward Thorne and Narcissa Niblack Thorne, uh, originally from Vincennes, Indiana, uh, commission him to do a house in Westlake Forest, sort of at the edge uh, of a great open land area. And the house is completed in 1912. Now. The house had a fire, and this is an historic picture, so you don't see that there was actually another wing here. The, the structure was done very much as the Ecole would have taught people to do in a highly symmetrical fashion. 
with two resolute end wings here and there, and the central bay marked with a three-part uh, articulation. This is since the house was restored recently by a current owner. I think they did a beautiful job restoring it, and they actually reconstructed the end wing, uh, in part by replicating what they knew to have been there from Otis and Clark's original drawings. In 1913, so just a couple of years later, Otis and Clark are again commissioned to do something here in Lake Forest, and they do a project for Mr. and Mrs. Kirk. Uh, this one, though, is very different. This one is inspired by Renaissance Tuscany, particularly a, a monastery that existed uh, in the hills uh, outside of Florence. Uh, and the name of it is, creates a sort of a perfect setup for where it was positioned. It's positioned to where two uh, ravines conjoin, and, and the, la the name in Latin for, uh, for Vallombrosa uh, means, Vallombrosa means uh, shaded valley or shady valley. So again, here you see those kinds of principles, I mean, some fairly straightforward principles of symmetry. But the other thing that I think is really important here is we see that Clark isn't copying styles. The, the whole notion of the language of style is something that was introduced by that, that top and bottom two architects that I showed you earlier, who were interested in basically discrediting the idea that you could look at an architectural language that predated your own life and use it effectively. Clark and Otis understood that, that you could speak new things with languages that predated you, just as Shakespeare did. Nothing about either of these structures that we've seen so far from Otis and Clark is a copy of anything. In other words, as much as we know that sometimes David Adler would have a favorite motif for an entry door, or for a whole massing of a building like La Lanterne up on Moffat, Otis and Clark composed things from scratch by using principles rather than by simply replicating things that they knew to be beautiful. Next. So in 1914, at age 36, uh, Clark becomes a member of the American Institute of Architects, and that same year the firm is commissioned to design the Indian Hill Country Club in Winnetka. Both architects were actually living there at the time. In 1915, he becomes a member of the, Society, the Illinois Society of Architects, which at that time at least was relatively significantly competitive with the American Institute of Architects. It was equally important and honorable to be a member of that. And in that same year, the partners designed the Chicago Municipal Tuberculosis Sanitarium. Uh, this picture, uh, which I found as I was sort of looking uh, for this, comes up in, in, in uh, William Otis's uh, collection of drawings uh, at the Art Institute. Shaw, uh, uh, Clark's, Clark's diaries are at the Art Institute of Chicago and some drawings, but other of Clark's drawings are actually at the Chicago History Museum. But this picture sort of reminded me of the, the amazing sort of tear that people must have felt sending an eight or a 10-year-old kid off to a place not knowing if they were going to come back because they were suffering from tuberculosis. Um, presumably, when, when Otis and Clark designed these buildings, they were sympathetic to that and tried to create a setting that would be as much like home as they could. In other words, they were trying to give them a place that was beautiful because of a fundamental understanding that beauty was important in the healing of the human soul. Again, what you will see is that we're not looking at a tower that's a replica of a tower that one found in southern France or northern Italy, but rather a newly created composition using a series of elements, a language, if you will, of architecture to make something that became a memorable piece of this. It helped to, to establish a sense of place at the sanitarium. In 1920, uh, after having been in that office for, for 12 years, uh, Edwin Hill Clark sets out, uh, it, it, having been there for 17 years, five, uh, 12 of which as a partner, Clark sets out on his own. And nine years later, William Otis, who presumably retired around that same time, I wasn't able to determine that ex definitively, but I think it's the case, uh, Otis dies at the age of 74. I use the words mentor and guide when the, uh, the Renaissance architect Andrea Palladio writes about how he came to understand classical architecture. He refers to the, the ancient Roman architect, uh, Marcus Vitruvius Pollio, who we know as Vitruvius, as having been his mentor and guide. I would submit that for Clark, Otis took a similar position. He took him under his wing and taught him how to be a classicist. So starting in 1920, for 33 years of his life, Edwin Hill Clark practiced as Edwin Hill Clark Architects. <coughs> 
We have a number, we've worked on a couple of his projects, and we have a number of the original blueprints, and it doesn't matter when you see work from his office during that time period, it's listed as Edwin Hill Clark Incorporated Architects. His office was located at 8 East Huron. This is literally the building where his office was. It still exists. Um, it obviously, at a point in its history, must have been a residence. It's clearly designed as a, as a, a row house or maybe an apartment building, a walk-up apartment building in that neighborhood would have been. This is the space that he called home for those, all those years, of the, the, the 33 years of the practice. The first four years of, those, of that point in his practice, he partnered with an architect named Chester Walcott. So for some of the Lake Forest houses that he worked on, he was working with Chester Walcott. Thereafter, he's on his own. Uh, in 1922, so two years after these guys have started on their own, they had a sufficient enough body of work that they exhibited drawings and, and, uh, drawings and photographs of projects at the, at the 35th Annual Architecture Exhibit at the Art Institute. And what I found particularly interesting, because the, there's a PDF of that available for anyone to see online, the, the, the guidebook from that exhibition, is like a pamphlet that accompanied it. Clark, who was 44 years old at the time, instead of on his own, instead of displaying other buildings that he had done, he displayed models of warships from the 16th, 17th, and 18th century. The point of that, to me, is that that goes back to speaking to the mentorship that I believe William Otis must have provided. He taught history at, to someone who was going to be a maker. And so Clark, learning that history, learned about things that were broader than just how to make a good pediment over a front door. Clark's interest was broad enough that one might actually have called him a connoisseur. Um, concurrent with that, the Chicago Zoological Society had their offices in the same building, and we'll see that that led actually to a bunch of work for Clark over the years. Context again. Starting in 1919 and going until it got shut down effectively in 1933, uh, in the three cities of Weimar, Dessau, and Berlin, uh, you had the Bauhaus. Um, under, under Barons Gropius and Mies, uh, a very, very different sort of expression than what was being practiced by Edwin Hill Clark. The argument that I want to make with that, uh, and this will sort of speak to it, is that notion of mar marginalization. The idea that architects that were interested in history as a mode of contemporary production, that the best of class, the classical language could be used as a mode of contemporary production for architecture, was being marginalized by people, and the same thing wasn't happening in the other direction. So it's interesting because our history began to be written by people who would characterize things with words like eclectic, with the pejorative connotation it has, that you just kind of do whatever you feel like, uh, historicist, as if you don't have a new idea in your brain, uh, and that language entrenched itself in American architectural culture and then in the common culture from the 1920s all the way up until the 1960s when Penn Station came down. When Penn Station came down, people said, wait a second, there's two stories here. And that's why things like the Preservation Foundation exist. And I, so I want to read this because I think this is important. Uh, it comes from uh, an essay that Mies wrote in 1924 called Architecture in the Times. And, and this was distributed widely. So part of it was to have an impact on the way architecture would be practiced by people and how institutions would perceive the work of architects. And so Mies says, it is hopeless to try to use the forms of the past in our architecture. Even the strongest artistic talent must fail in this attempt. Again and again, we see talented architects who fall short because their work is not in tune with their age. In the last analysis, in spite of their great gifts, they are dilettantes for it makes no difference how enthusiastically they do the wrong thing. There's a moral tone to this, right? You're actually evil because you're doing the wrong thing if you don't make something that looks the way he designs buildings. Then he, they, but then he continues, it is a question of essentials. It's not possible to move forward and look backward, even though the Roman god Janus, who's one of the most well-renowned of the gods, has faces that look in both directions. He marked gateways in the city of Rome, and the idea was you can actually look in both directions and end up with a more secure future because you know what's coming just as much as you know what has happened. The individual is losing significance. His destiny is no longer what interests us. The decisive achievements in all fields are impersonal, and their authors are for the most part unknown. They are part of the trend of our time toward anonymity. Now, you, any of you that caught at least the news about it on, on Monday, uh, after the Academy Awards, got to see that the, the, a number of the participants in the Academy Awards ceremony published to the world via Twitter and other social media the so-called selfie. So apparently, 
the trend of the time is actually not toward anonymity, or if it was the trend of his time, then perhaps his work is locked into that time and can't actually be as universal as Clark's is. So this is a little listing, and, and we don't have time to show all the slides, uh, or at least enough slides to show all these, although I'll show you several of these. But it's important to get a sense of how, what I was saying about Illinois Toolworks earlier, that there's a building in about 10 minutes drive from almost anywhere you are, and we should be aware of that. Uh, this is someone who had great importance, but again, because he practiced classical architecture, found himself lost in the tide toward modernism. So he did the master plan in a, many of the buildings in the original Brook, Brookfield Zoo design, the North Shore Country Day School in, in Winnetka, uh, which he lived near, uh, and both the master plan and individual buildings, uh, the aquarium uh, building at Lincoln Park Zoo, the administrative office at Lincoln Park Zoo, uh, Winnetka's Village Hall, uh, the Latin School in Chicago, the Plaza del Lago in Wilmette, the Hinsdale Memorial Hall, which is their city hall library. It's a combination building. It's a, it's a quite good building. The small animal house at Lincoln Park Zoo, uh, the Ridge Farm Preventorium, which uh, Lake Foresters know as Sterling and, and Dickinson Hall, at least the remaining buildings are those. Uh, the library that we're in today, which is a magnificent structure, uh, the Jacob Walford Memorial Tower and Waveland Field House along Lakeshore Drive, you frequently see that as you go into the city, past Lincoln Park. He worked on some of the buildings at the Century of Progress, uh, and, and it says this is a partial list. I haven't begun to ferret out all the other buildings he did because this list stops in the late 1930s and he practiced till 1953, so obviously he did a lot more stuff. But he did the Pachyderm House in Washington, D.C. on the heels of the respect that he garnered by having done the Lincoln Park and Brookfield Zoo. So Brookfield Zoo, uh, just some simple notes about what these things were. In this case, a master plan based on these kind of axial principles of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts and also the simultaneous situation of the City Beautiful movement, which, which uh, had some of its most important practitioners here in Chicago. This character here on the far left of the picture, and I'm trying to make sure that everybody can see it, uh, that's Edwin Hill Clark. Um, being appropriately deferential, he didn't put himself at the head of the table. Um, and you see the, the, a model of the master plan for the, for the zoo. The structures, the structures evolved in very much a way similar to Vallambrosa uh, in, in, a, in a use of architectural character that one would characterize, I would think, uh, as Italian Renaissance. This uh, picture a bit unfortunate because the zoo thought to put these giant murals in. They do that obviously at the Field Museum now between the columns as well. Um, the whole point of a colonnade is so that you have transparency and, and then they fill them in. But obviously this would have been an open loggia that would have done a beautiful job connecting spaces. I can assure you that the, that the overscaled uh, lettering in the frieze uh, is not by Clark. The North Shore Country Day School. This goes hand in hand with his idea, and you think about Thomas Jefferson at the University of Virginia talking about the so-called academical village, that a place where one studies can be like a small city. Uh, Alberti, the Renaissance treatise writer uh, from Italy, also spoke about the idea that a city is like a, a small uh, is like a small house, and a house is like a, or a, and a house a house is like a small city, and a city is like a big house. Um, so this is one of the structures he did at the North Shore Country Day School, again using what I would call a restrained classical idiom. The Lincoln Park Zoo, uh, starting in the mid-1920s, so right after Mies wrote that essay that you saw and it was receiving publicity. Uh, this is the administration building uh, from the zoo. The so-called small animal house, which is the primate house. Uh, an amazingly sort of subtle essay in, in what some might characterize as Georgian classicism. I simply prefer to call it classical. Uh, we, I don't think we need, again, to attach, attach narrow stylistic labels. It's more about the character of it. Here's one of the details. One of the things that he was very much aware of was the idea that, that, that carving and the allied arts were an essential complement to architecture. You didn't do architecture without painting and sculpture. And then, uh, and then the aquarium building, and I show uh, Palladio's Basilica in Vicenza simply to show that this, motif, what we call a motif, this kind of combined piece of architectural language, which is the central arc, uh, arch flanked by two rectangular openings, uh, which is properly called a Surliana, um, that the Surliana has its first uh, deployment, if you will, uh, as early as the 16th century. And Clark isn't copying any of that, but rather using that as a kind of a linguistic element in the articulation of the buildings. Uh, 
And then this is a little bit of a hiccup. This is the, uh, but just to show it because there won't be other reason to, uh, this is the elephant house from the Washington National Zoo from the, the late 1930s. And again, here there's a rather overt use of the architectural treatises of the 16th century, particularly in this case, the, the treatise uh, by Jacopo uh, Barozzi da Vignola. The Winnetka Village Hall, Edward Bennett, Lake Forest's own Edward Bennett, who lived at the corner of Deer Path and Green Bay Road, uh, and designed the, the infamous and, and rightly uh, revered plan of Chicago with Daniel Burnham in 1909, later did an urban plan for the village of Winnetka, and it established a very specific place for a focal point, a civic building that would define the identity of the community, and, and the village hall uh, that Clark designed is what resulted. It is an absolutely sublime building. It's been stripped now of the, uh, of the ivy because Unlike some buildings, uh, Clark's buildings seem to be really adaptable. And so when you need to reuse them and remodel them, they, they serve that really well. And so they've been able to uh, maintain their village offices in this building, but they've, they've cleaned the, the vines off to protect the stonework. So here we are coming up close to 100 years, and the building is, is into its, the beginning of its new life. The Latin School in Chicago, uh, which I would characterize as a particularly sort of sublime piece of urban architecture, it anchors Dearborn at the north end of Dearborn Street in a way that's, that's perfectly fitting because it weds the kind of grander architecture of the condominium buildings that terminate Dearborn with the row houses that mark the, the length of the street south of there. The Plaza del Lago, which you're all familiar with, but which I think is important to see, is in what was so-called no man's land between Incorporated Wilmette and Incorporated Kenilworth. Um, again, Wilmette residents and Kenilworth residents would both claim this as their center of town because in so many ways he established an architectural character that it allowed it to become a place. The Hinsdale Memorial Hall, um, a little further afield, it's more than a 10 minute drive. Um, here you, I think we see Clark uh, demonstrating that civic identity is tied up with the nature of the architecture of the American democracy. So if you think about our constitutional founding fathers and the kind of architecture they did, like Independence Hall, I think you'll see very directly that there are affinities, but you'll also see distinctions. And, in, and down below the, the City Hall in Dover, New Hampshire, one sees a kind of a common vocabulary, and yet Clark is sufficiently inventive that his creates a, a unique and, and separate identity for Hinsdale. The Memorial Tower and Waveland Field House, which many of you, I'm sure, have passed endless numbers of times on Lakeshore Drive and thought, it's a beautiful structure out there, and now you know who did it. Uh, the vines have been stripped, which is probably healthier for the brick, and the clock was recently, and its chimes, or chimes in there, were just recently restored. This building, um, the interior of which, and, and you're going to take the tour, the library's been so gracious to let us be in here, um, the interior demonstrates that it was built in 1930 because there are the influences of, of a kind of a cleaner aesthetic, if you will. Um, but you also see plenty of debt to things as, as ancient as the Pantheon in Rome, and I think you can see very clearly and emblematically that relationship. But also you see how our own American forefathers, Thomas Jefferson, a kind of an amateur architect, adopted that language, and we actually see that maybe Clark is looking as much at Jefferson as he was at the Pantheon. The point is that he's assimilated this as a language and used it in a new and creative historic process. So this will be just a quick set of views of the houses he's done uh, in Lake Forest, an image basically per house, and even some of the houses aren't here, but just to give you a handle on the fact that he was able to use this language with a great deal of variety. The Carton Residence, which is on East Laurel in, in a Georgian idiom. The Swift Residence, which you all know just to the south uh, of the Anwensia Club, uh, really a sort of a magnificent structure, but the composition of which one can find analogs back in the work that he was doing with William Otis. In other words, this is a language that he was comfortable with. He learned how to compose asymmetrical compositions with Otis and to do it in a way that resolved itself. The Prosser residence on Elm Tree Road, uh, north, of the, north of the ravine, a more humble house for a bachelor, uh, using half timbering. Uh, one of the things that Otis was interested in, and they did in the Winnetka neighborhoods, 
uh, were half-timbered houses, uh, houses related more to the 15th century. The kind of the, the simple bones of American colonial architecture influenced the work that he did on Rosemary for the Wilson residence. And then out in Santa Barbara, California, because the Thorns just couldn't get enough working with him, they hired Clark to do a house for them in Santa Barbara, California. And when they did the house, and it's recently been restored, which is why it looks so uh, bright and lemony, um, this house, Montjoy, which you can see from above, I think it demonstrates pretty clearly that Clark knew what he was doing when it came to using the classical language in a way that was creative and complex without copying anything. And then if you drive down uh, Woodland here, right as you hit Green Bay Road, you will be looking straight up the driveway of the, the former Hafner residence, uh, a Georgian, uh, symmetrically disposed Georgian house that owes a lot to uh, predecessors on the eastern seaboard. In other words, Clark was equally comfortable looking to the ways in which his, his predecessors on this side of the Atlantic used classicism as looking to the other side. So now, of the, and I think there are more houses, and that needs more research, but of the 14 houses known to have been designed by Clark, only three were built after the stock market crash of 1929, so we should all feel a bit of empathy for him because I think that this must have been haunting for someone with that talent to suddenly see things quiet. Uh, the last of those dates to 1932, which is only a year or two after the completion of the library. So when your work slows down, you find other things to do with your time, and the Thorns had so much fun working with them in, in uh, California and Lake Forest, and also uh, Narcissa Thorne had him work on her apartment in Chicago, that she began designing these miniature rooms that you all know because you've been to the Art Institute and you hear about them endlessly. And for me, the important thing was that was a vehicle, that was how Clark took what he'd learned and transported it forward. In other words, he created a series of, of architectural artifacts, if you will, they could be used to teach other people about this language. Now, the examples were highly specific, so it was an 18th century room from England or it was a 17th century room from France, but you were able to see a unification of all the arts. So you were able to understand how porcelain and other decorative arts objects and furniture and architecture combined to make resonant architectural settings. Uh, those rooms, interestingly, first got displayed at the Century of Progress exhibition uh, on what's now Northerly Ireland, uh, and it began a lifelong kind of fascination that I think all of Chicago has with them. There's this never more than 10 minutes away thing. They remain, and I just saw a video, I was looking at this, a video from the Art Institute. It's one of the most popular exhibitions in the entire museum. When you think about what the Art Institute has, it's kind of astonishing that they play that role. Why are people that fascinated with it, and why aren't more buildings being built that look like that? because there's still the vestiges of this sense that that's looking backward that resonate through the culture, which is why the man shell in Millennium Park looks the way it does instead of being something like what we could imagine Clark having done. And you're familiar with what those look like. So Clark did drawings for these rooms. At least 10 of the rooms he did architectural drawings. They're done at one inch to the foot scale, um, which is a nice scale because it was a kind of easily associated scale. Um, Clark did the drawings and then, and then a number of different people did the execution, craftspeople did the execution, all kind of at the behest of, of Narcissa and Niblack Thorne. So the final leg of the jury, the journey. Um, in 1939, Clark applied for fellow status in the American Institute of Architects and was declined. And this is precisely because at this point, the pervasiveness of this notion that architecture could only look in a certain direction, it could only turn to the industrial age as a way of finding some way to make buildings, marginalized people like Clark. So you saw that list of buildings, you've all been touched by his buildings, we're standing in one that's still in continuous use, but he was declined fellow status. Uh, in 1946, um, his wife died, and they lived at 251 White Oak Lane. I literally run past his house every day on a distance running route I have, and uh, I only found out recently it was his house, it turns out that in my life, I've kind of touched that the Illinois Tool Works thing. I've been affected by him in about 25 different ways. It turns out that he lived just uh, a few blocks from where I now live. And then he lived out his years at the Homestead Hotel in Evanston, which is the only building in Evanston that I've ever done any work on in my career. I, my office is based in Evanston, <laughs> but, but 
his, I did it where he basically finished his life out. And interestingly, what he did was he bequeathed to the hotel a number of important paintings and works of art, which are still in the hotel, because he had this beautiful decorative arts collection, furniture, but also paintings and drawings that he wanted to stay there for other people to see. He was constantly trying to become the mentor for others that Otis had been for him. So he continued to practice until uh, uh, end of 1953, uh, 21 years after the last house he did here. So I, I don't yet know what all those 21 years included, but obviously he was doing things that were important. And he spent a half of a century creating architecture. And in fact, it's been almost exactly that many years since people did a real appraisal of him. In January of that year, uh, he died at the age of 88. In that same year, 1967, um, I went to my mom and dad, and I, I was seven years old at the time, and I said, I want to be an architect. <laughs> so this is the last slide. The durable legacy of a master. I would submit that it's really important for all of us to begin to rehabilitate people like Stanley Anderson, which Paul Bergman's doing a great job with. Edwin Hill Clark, Howard Van Doren Shaw. These are architects whose work I would submit actually in, to the extent that they created a sense of place where they built their buildings, surpassed the relevance of some of those guys that bracketed them. Those were more about individual displays. Clark and these others were more about making communities. Uh, so we're going to adjourn from here. We're going to adjourn uh, to the so-called Farwell Tuttle residence, which interestingly John Hughes uh, the movie director and his wife selected as their home. The fact that someone who was so well connected with the notion of storytelling about helping us to understand our lives in the form of a narrative would pick a, a Clark house I think is pretty telling. What it says is that he recognized in there something quintessentially American and rooted in the way that we want to live our lives. Uh, Mrs. Hughes is being gracious enough to let us go there today. The, the quote at the top is a follow-on to the uh, Non è basta una vita, not a, a lifetime wouldn't be enough, and, and I didn't take quite a lifetime, but nearly. Um, <laughs> this quote is another, and it's a, it's a, it's a kind of a variation on it. The, the Italian quote is, se non è vero è ben trovato. If it's not true, it should be. And what I say here is, so what I say here is, the durable legacy of a master, it's true even if it's not well known. And what's important is that groups like the Preservation Foundation continue and we have that. Uh, continue to help us to understand that truth. Thank you very much.